Hello and welcome back. Today we are here with my dear friend, Sean Monson. You are an incredible filmmaker, creator of the hit documentaries, Earthlings and Unity, and co-producer of the documentary, Dominion, to name a few. You are also a father of two beautiful girls, a speaker, and one of the most dedicated and sincere animal advocates I've ever met. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks, Gianna. What was making Earthlings like and what inspired you to make this documentary? Um, good question. It started pretty simple, actually. I was doing a, uh, I was in Hollywood and there was a stray cat and uh, this little stray cat. And um, I was chatting with somebody about strays in LA because I live in LA and I was just curious. And it, and someone said, oh, you know, like in downtown, there's like loads and loads and loads of strays. And the area I lived in, I didn't see as many strays, sometimes strays. I don't know why you'll see you'll see less in certain areas. For instance, you won't see a lot of strays by the airport maybe, but you might see some in industrial parts of town. You might see some in poor areas. Uh, you'd see less in affluent areas. And it just seemed, I just got curious about this idea of strays, like strays in, and it, uh, it seems like a pretty, just a thought, but I was so curious that I reached out to two parts of the city, downtown, South Central, LA, because I heard there were a lot of strays downtown. I didn't know that for a fact. And um, also Long Beach, the city of Long Beach, I'd heard. So uh, animal control, contacted animal control. And both um, <clears throat> both animal control uh, divisions in Long Beach and South Central LA allowed me to go on uh, a ride along with them and oh, film. Wow. So that's how, that's how, this is how Earthling started. So um, and I'll never forget, I'll tell a story. So in Long Beach, uh, I went out with an ACO, animal control officer, I call them ACOs, the woman. I have some footage of this, a little bit in Earthlings. And I shot on two formats. I brought a Super 8 camera to shoot a little bit of film look. This was 1999 or 2000, maybe, actually it might have been 2001, just right in there. And I had a digital camera at the time, the digital quality camera time, which was a Canon XL1, which shot on a mini DV format, which is nowhere near the level of definition we have today, but that was what we had. And I was picking and choosing, what should I shoot a little bit of film and what should I shoot digital? Um, and this woman, this ACO that I'm on a ride along with, she's picking up some, all kinds, you get a call, um, there'd be roadkill a dog that had been hit she'd pick up so she just kind of had this these rounds essentially and i was i was on a ride along with her and she said oh today we have to go to a house we have a complaint of a barking dog i said okay now this was a wednesday i won't forget this and she said um we actually got the complaint end of last week and we have a right to post what's called a pre-seizure notice which gives the occupant 24 hours to respond to the barking dog, or we can come in, animal control can come in and remove the animal, take the animal out. So pre-seizure notice is posted on the door if they don't answer, and they have 24 hours to respond. This does not include the weekend. This is significant. So it was posted on a Friday. So the 24 hour window didn't exactly take effect until maybe into halfway on Monday. Okay. And they didn't, weren't going to go Monday. So Tuesday, someone was going to follow up. Now the call came in on a Thursday and the pre-seizure notice was posted on a Friday. It is now Tuesday and no one went on Tuesday. I'm on the ride along Wednesday. And she says, oh, today I have to go. So I was like, okay. So we get there to this big house, two-story house. This is in Long Beach. And I have this footage and the big part of the story is not in Earthlings. And at some point I might release all this, the story I'm telling you. We get to this house. I can see the pre-seizure notice on the door, not unlike an addiction notice, something. It's just a piece of paper stuck to the door and it says what's going on. And we can hear the dog barking upstairs still. In the house? In the house. In this house, the dog has been barking. Now the neighbors have put up with this barking dog since at least Thursday of last week. Dead. So, so, so the story, this is my first day and this is all part of the, forgive the animal metaphor, but the rabbit hole of going down what would become ultimately 
earth earthlings in a way this these little story starting with a strike so we go around to the back and she says all right we get to go into the house and she says we got to call the police but animal control is part of the police and police show up and this this aco she was it was hot it was july it was summer and she said you know what i think it's a pit and just listening to the sound i think it's a pit bull and um so the cops show up and they say what's up and she says well da, da, da. she fills them in and, and they go okay let's let's we'll break in let's you know no one's responded for days we're gonna bust in and take this dog out of there and she oh, says i think goodness. she says i think it's the pit and the cops are like okay we're not too crazy about the pits and she's got her pole with the with the lasso and she says don't worry it's all right and so i've got my camera and i'm gonna follow cops first a, a cops will break in acl then will lead in with the pole in case there's an aggressive dog and i'm in the back with a camera first day of filming not even know i'm gonna i'm gonna make a, a feature film about essentially animal exploitation but but this is how it starts and there's no furniture in this house this is an empty house someone has left a dog in an empty house and so we go up the stairs she's upstairs and she's uh in a room and the door's closed and he op she opens the door and out comes, and I have this footage, this beautiful pit, sweet mother with two puppies. Oh. And she's, she's, very, she's very thin. She's very skinny. She doesn't, she's not aggressive at all. The cops kind of have their guns. They're just not sure, you know, it's a pit bull. And she goes in, and, and, uh, and there's nothing in the room except uh, there's dog waste. There's poop all over this room. There's no furniture. And I, I remember there was a fire, uh, a fire extinguisher, just which I have footage of. There's just like this red fire extinguisher just sitting in the middle of the room. And so someone moved out and put this dog and her two puppies there. And what happened was she had no food or water. And um, she was calling for help. And she had nursed her puppies until she was dry. And her puppies were frail and it's just skin and bones so so there's no threat so we take this mother and her two puppies out of this house into the truck the animal control truck which has if you've seen them on the road you know they have these kind of compartments we can put animals in and we we've got to take them to the vet to be to be looked at now they're still considered property because of this house and this pre-seizure notice is part of sort of a a city, I don't know the laws of this, but which is what I remember what they told me, but it's, it's, it's a paperwork process. And so we go to the vet and they put the mother in one kennel and her two pups in another and they feed, they give them water. And that mother practically devoured the bowl. She was so thirsty and hungry. And the pups who have never had solid food are just, they're starving. They've been, they've been, who knows when they were put in that house they believe that it was might have been some gang kids possibly in the area that she could have been a fighter she could have been something they just but they stuck her in this upstairs room in this abandoned house and left her there so there was no owner that we know oh we we interviewed the neighbors and asked them did the owner have this dog and then they moved and they just left and said no the previous tenant never had a dog so someone came in while the house was empty before it was rented or sold and left this mother and her two puppies up in this room in the summer in july Oh my goodness. Now here's what happens. So so the um the process is this a pre-seizure notice at the time, from what I remember, this is 20 years ago, is about 30 days for the paperwork to go through in the city. This gives the owner, uh, at least at the home, they have to follow the paperwork, even though it was most likely not the previous owner, a chance to come and reclaim their animals. The 30 days has to go through. So they nurse this mother and her two babies back to health for 30 days. They live at animal control. No one comes to claim them. And then because they're pits, and at the time that was still considered an aggressive breed it is today by in many areas, all three were euthanized. What? And this story just like um, wait, 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 wait. Why? Well, you heard it, you heard it right. You heard it right. You heard so everything. At the like hospital, it. they decided that because they're because they're considered an aggressive breed and they couldn't be adopted in the city of Long Beach at that time, even though they had to have the 30-day pre-seizure notice go through, 
they then were all three euthanized, the mother and her two pups. So they couldn't give them to a shelter? No, at the time. So this moment, like, um, you know, it just, it struck me. And I, um, I just thought, I thought, what's, it seemed so unjust. It just seemed like the voice was just, you know, like, well, it just seemed so unfair. It really it, it broke my heart. And it, I began to probe deeper. So these are what we consider pets. And this, I was still filming. Um, I did I did a PSA, a public service announcement on spaying and neutering. And uh, I made those. And um, with this footage I shot, because I also did a ride along in South Central. Similarly, didn't have a story like this, but noticed things. For instance, in South Central, I was driving with this one ACO. And he says, what you're going to see happen is, is that people who don't want their animals anymore will wave us down almost like an ice cream truck. And he says, and they will literally pick up, you know, if they're small and they'll literally just hand them over the fence. And, you know, you know, they have a, a, a form for it. Um, the owner is, um, you know, gosh, I forget the name of it. It just went out of my mind, but it's an, oh, oh, it's an owner relinquishment form. The owner's relinquishing. And we watch people hand over their, their animals like garbage, like garbage on garbage day. And they would just go in. And so I remember these three chihuahuas were on the porch. And as we pulled up, they were sitting one under one on grandma's lap and two by her rocking chair. And they just took them and said, oh, these weren't ours. They just showed up. They clearly looked to me like, like they were a family pet, so to speak. Um, and they were put in the truck and they would take me to the shelter and then they look at them and decide, are they healthy? Can they be readopted? Should they be euthanized? They're not healthy. And all three of those you know, with poodles or chihuahuas were just trembling in a cage because uh, their whole life had suddenly just, just in a moment. And this is what started Earthlings. I'm sorry, it's such a long answer to your question, but it began, I began probing and I went from suddenly from pets, I began sort of thinking about food. And then from food, I found myself exploring clothing you know and from clothing i found myself delving a little more into animals used in entertainment and from there it was um animals used for medical research and i vividly remember laying in bed as all this began to dawn on me and i thought someone someone needs to put together like the definitive encyclopedia kind of movie about all the ways humans exploit animals for economic purposes. I'm like, someone really, really needs to go do this. And I'm laying there going, oh man, I think, I think it's me. I think it's me. I'm not qualified for this. I'd never made a documentary before. Wow. And so that's the origin of Earthlings and answer to your question. Wow, Sean, you know, this, um, I was just doing some, um, investigation last night and I saw this post or this um this this blog that somebody wrote um who was a Christian and a vegan mm -hmm. and there's this word I'm I don't know how to pronounce it but it's spelled m-e-n-e-p-h-e-s-h nefesh maybe ne n-e-p-a hmm. yeah what's -E -E it mean n-e-p-h-e-s-h nefesh okay um, or nefesh and it's um it's in the bible 130 times and it refers to the soul and a lot of people think that just humans have soul and so i asked my friend who speaks hebrew and i said i said what is this what does this word mean and she said soul it means mind or soul it is what we create with and it's mentioned 130 times in reference mm. to humans and animals. Mm. And so um, I just kept thinking that as you, as you were talking, that we, we don't value, I don't know why we have such a hard time valuing or even giving credit or admission that beings other than humans have a soul and can feel and can create i just i just don't understand it and and as you were talking it's so obvious that they do 
Mm. And it's really, it's really frustrating that some people just don't care. Some people don't care. And we live in this throwaway society mm. and we play such a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people play such little value on life. Mm. And it's really overwhelming to mm. hear you, you talk about those babies and those innocent creatures. It's really disturbing to be honest. I know. I know it. I don't know if it's because there's something in the let's call it the evolution of consciousness of a human, the evolution of consciousness of a human. That for whatever reason, perhaps it's ego, I'm not sure, but we're already almost inherently, it seems, tribal. Even if you say my family, um, my community, my group, um, they're my favorite football team, you know, uh, this or that. There tends to be, for whatever reason, at lower, let's say lower levels of consciousness, I don't know what, how else to phrase it, more of a tribal mentality that as we evolve consciously and one might say spiritually i don't see how they wouldn't really be one and the same right. anyway you begin to these barriers begin to dissolve and you begin to see let's start with the human race you begin to see humanity as opposed to a tribal portion of humanity mm. but what happens is is that it seems that compassion is um this is also something that we evolve spiritually or consciously and that is compassion tends to go you maybe you've heard this before usually as far as our reflection in the mirror similarities right now you take an animal it looks totally different from the reflection in the mirror some animals similar eyes nose mouth some we get into sort of aquatic animals eyes mouth but pretty i mean you know a jellyfish is alien it's absolutely alien to the reflection in the mirror i mean there's no correlation whatsoever Take it even further into nature, like a tree. A tree looks nothing like a human. And and so, and the animal still has a voice. If you, it, For anybody who has, you know, companion animals at home and inadvertently steps on your dog's paw or cat's paw, they'll yelp and let you know. Nice. It, they'll, they'll let you know. You know, um, the first law of biology is survival. So if there's a fire, an animal doesn't have to be taught. Okay, here's what you do right go away you know they get it they immediately get it so the first law of biology is survival um and uh so you know um animals feel but 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 we for some reason are have not only have a hard time having compassion for our fellow man but for things that don't look like us the trees of course make no sound at all when you chop them down they're completely silent um so now what is the first law of the spirit compassion so this is interesting so the first law of biology is survival and the first law of the first law of the spirit is compassion okay. is compassion yeah the first law of the spirit is compassion so first law of biology is survival so when a soldier runs into the battlefield to protect a fellow soldier from certain death he or she is violating the laws of the universe in terms of survival being the first law of biology but they are exhibiting the first law of the spirit, compassion. The mother who runs into the street to save her child from an oncoming truck is violating the laws of the universe if we have no souls and we are nothing but biological organisms who therefore our first law is survival because the first law of the spirit is compassion. She will willingly run into the road to save her child from the truck, violating the laws of biology. This to me is almost scientific proof that we are spiritual beings on another level. Anytime you witness compassion, compassion on any level in the face of biology, survival, to me it is, um, it, is, it is a proof that we're spiritual beings. And somewhere way back when with the dinosaurs or who knows what, they used to lay eggs and say, see ya, you're on your own. Good luck, little guys. But somewhere at some point, I don't know when, not a, you know, 
an expert, but at some point, some maternal instinct, perhaps the first on earth, kicked in somewhere where a mother stayed with the eggs until they were born. Hmm. So it's just very interesting to think about this stuff, I think. So interesting. I love talking with you. Um, the first law of the spirit is compassion. Where did you learn that? Where did you hear about that? When I was researching unity, when I was researching unity, uh, which is considered a sequel to Earthlings, but it's such a far departure from Earthlings. Um, but the idea was one film about animals, uh, one film, which is Earthlings, one film about humanity, which is unity, and one film about nature, which is called Beings, which I haven't made yet, which is sort of sitting on the back burner for however long it takes because Earthlings tend tend to go over a lot of people's heads. I mean, a lot of people that um, uh, are sensitive to animals understood it, but that's a very small percentage, still five, six, seven, less than 10%. Unity went way over people's heads. And so I thought, oh, I wonder if I'll make beings in this lifetime. It may not, it, it, we may just have to stick with the two and just see if they're assimilated in some way. Um, but during the research of unity, in answer to your question, I was researching laws of biology. That was pretty easy to find, which was survival. But compassion is what you always hear, forgiveness and compassion. It seems to be a tenant that needs to be assimilated by humanity and mortality. It just seems to be something that is reiterated over and over again. Forgiveness, compassion, empathy, sympathy, like these points are stressed repeatedly, particularly under stressful situations when they're put to the test at, at best. Otherwise, we're, we're all theory. We're all academic. And we're not really ever being truly put to the test under pressure. So that's where I came across that. I forget what book I read it in or sources I read it from, but, but the first law of the spirit is compassion. The way you met Joaquin Phoenix is wild. How did you oh, meet him? Now we're talking about coincidences. I don't know what you know, coincidences, right? It's just... Um, so no, my father was is a lawyer, and um, he, he's an he was an inter entertainment lawyer. He's retired, and um, but when I was a kid in uh, just early in high school, freshman maybe fourteen, and I was a young. My birthday was in is in September, so I was always I just squeaked in with the kids. So I was last to get my driver's license. I didn't get it my junior year. I didn't get it for myself. Yeah, I didn't get it till the following year because all the kids had birthdays earlier in the year, and I was they cut it off right around September. So I was always the youngest. So anyway, I was a very young freshman, you know, maybe eight months, nine months younger than most of the kids. And so, which meant I was more immature, <laughs> what I'm trying to say. And uh, in the in the 80s, I grew up in the 80s, and um, there was a TV show called, there was a TV show called The Fall Guy, which was a, 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 um, an action show with this actor named Lee Majors, and he played a stuntman who would go out and okay, moonlight. He okay. Yeah, he, he would moonlight as a, as a bounty hunter. And I liked I liked uh, Lee Majors as actor because he reminded me a bit of my father for some reason. This TV actor he didn't look exactly, but something about him reminded me of my dad. My folks were divorced. I grew up with my mother. I didn't see my dad as much as I'd hoped. And and uh, there was an earlier show he'd done called The Six Million Dollar Man. And I just I just liked Lee Majors. And he did this show, The Fall Guy, and I liked it. And uh, so that was in middle school and into high school. And um, my dad had a secretary named Jan Leonard at the time, and Jan had been married to one of the best stuntmen in Hollywood in the 80s named Terry Leonard. And uh, Terry Leonard, this is an older reference, but for those who've seen the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is classic, of course, when Indiana Jones goes under the truck, you know, with his whip and everything, that's Terry Leonard that does that stunt. Um, when uh, in a movie called Romancing the Stone, when Michael Douglas dives off a waterfall, that's Terry Leonard. So he just did huge stunts in the 80s. Just He's one of the biggest stuntmen at the time. And, him and Janet had been married, they got divorced, and she happened to just work with my dad at this law firm. And my dad mentioned my son is a big fan of this TV show. And she goes, my ex does a stunt coordinator for all kinds of shows. If you want to have him visit a set, I can just set it up. And he says, great, let's do it. So one day dad said, you're going down to the set of Fall Guy. And I'm 13 years old, you know, and I'm just like 14. And I'm like, wow, I, I couldn't wait to see Lee Majors in the flesh, you know, the idea. And so we get down there, they were filming in Balboa Park and um, and my dad took me out of school and I was just over the moon and going on, going on a set. And I knew I wanted to be in the film business even as a, as a kid. Mm -hmm. And um, and Lee wasn't there that day. I was so bummed. It was like a second unit shooting day or something. And I didn't get to see him, but I watched him shoot some stunts and Terry was there and, and Terry Leonard. And um, there was this kid 
who's younger than me on set because they were shooting some of the supporting roles, not the principals that day and some, getting some coverage. And there was this young kid. because I, So I'm 14, let's say. I don't remember. So he had to be nine wow. or 10. And, and I was jealous of this kid, this punk kid who is in the show. He's acting on the show. He, he gets to be in it. He's younger than me. And I'm like, how? I'm over. I'm basically a tourist over on the side watching. And he's in it acting and the director's talking to him and he's makeup and this. And I was just like, who is this kid? And I just bummed me out. Like, when the show came out, the episode I watched it on television, I remembered it for years. And it was years later after Earthlings, many, many years later that I, um, I tried to look up again that episode. I was trying to remember because what happens is, is that, you know, a show will have five or six or so seasons or whatever with 20 or so episodes per season. And I was, and I remember, and I found it. I was like, oh yeah, this was an episode. And the episode was called Terror You because it had something to do with some terrible thing that happened at a university. So it was called Terror You. And I look at it and the child actor was Leaf Phoenix which was the name Joaquin used when he was younger. And oh, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't believe it. I thought, what are the odds? Because we'd already done Earthlings by this time and we've begun working on a couple of things. And I just happened to be randomly looking up this old memory. And I couldn't believe that the day, the one day that my dad or his secretary said, I can take you down to visit a show. And Terry Leonard did a lot of shows, not just The Fall Guy, but we happened to get that. But that day... It was that episode that he too was working or that week that he was working and that it wouldn't be another, it wouldn't be for another 15 years or so until we meet and wow. work on earthlings. But um, that is the first time we were uh, in each other's orbit, you might say, which is interesting. So does Joaquin remember meeting you there on that stage? <laughs> I mentioned it to him once. I said, dude, did you, and he, he just brushes it aside just whatever, you know, <laughs> he's just in the present. So he's like, ah, whatever, you know. You guys were supposed to meet. I yeah. mean, that's what that screams to me is that yeah. you kept crossing paths. Yeah. It's so powerful. Did, yeah. yeah. Just so later when I was doing Earthlings, I had sort of cutting it and I maybe had 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes. I was still putting it together. I was still finding the film. And um, I edited it in my garage in Burbank. I was renting a house in Burbank by Warner Brothers and I turned the garage into a little studio and I was editing the film there. And um, um, in 2000, in in the summer of 2000 a film called gladiator came out and i went to see it and i'd already been i started working on earthlings in 99 like like the incident with the animal control officers was in 99 and 2000 and just it was just it was just workshopping what it, what it might be and um when i saw that film i thought that's the voice hmm. that you know joaquin plays as emperor in that film i thought that's the voice that's the voice for earthlings that's the narrator's voice and so you didn't meet him for the second time yet? Or did I, no, I, ha I had no contact with him. I had, I, I, I had no, I just knew when I saw the movie I, in, in sort of my in, in, intuition, I thought that's, that's, that's the voice. That's the voice of, that's the voice of Earthlings. I just know it. That this actor, this is the one, this, this Joaquin Phoenix is the voice. And I found out who was. I didn't go to his agent because I didn't have any money to pay him. So it was kind of an educational piece. I went to his publicist, Susan Patricola, the publicist, sweet woman. And, and I asked, she said, no, I'm nobody. I'm nobody with no distribution. It's not going to, we don't know if it's going to go anywhere yet. They haven't, I have no track record, but I just, knew, I just knew he had to do it. And then I, I, I pressed her again and she said, no. And then I thought I'd try one more time. I thought, you know, uh, a squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Is the idea. So I just thought, but just shy of annoying, right? Like not, not like right. too much, but just persistence. And I, I think she's exasperated, but she said, just send me a sample. Send me a sample of what it is. Now I had laid my own voice down originally. I did this on Unity as well. I, I would lay my own voice down for cadence just to get a sense of pacing, you know, just a general idea because it, it is dictating the cut, you know, because what's tricky about documentaries, especially if you're pulling in archival footage or you're putting, pulling in hidden camera footage where you have limited coverage, where the filmmaker is, doesn't have master, medium, close up, over the shoulder. Like you don't have this, you're, you're reduced to working with whatever 
is available, especially in like an expose kind of a piece or a hidden camera piece. So it creates its own tempo. It creates a tempo, limited footage. Plus I have a narrative that is articulating to the viewer. This is kind of the context of what's happening. So I would lay my own voice down and fine tune it. Like, do I want to say it like this or say it like that? Can I, can I consolidate a little more and make it more concise? So I laid that down. And so I did, I sent a five minute sample. Uh, I, I forget what issue in the film that I cut, I sent it to her with my voice and I sent her a VHS tape because this was probably 2000, late 2000, 2001. So I sent her a VHS tape <laughs> and uh, I got a response pretty fast. <gasps> she called me and she said, um, I was so nervous when I saw that she called and I picked it up and she said, okay, Joaquin, I'll meet you. <gasps> and I, and I thought, Oh, they'll, they'll consider it. And I met him at the Peninsula Hotel here in Los Angeles. And he opened the door and we ended up having a conversation for a few hours. And here I am thinking, okay, I've written, I'm writing and directing and producing this movie. And I'm going to look, I'm going to look, listen to this actor and see if this is the right one. But the truth of the matter, he was interviewing me decide if he was going to do it the other way around of course and I knew he was the one he said I'll do it and the next day we started recording because he was going back to New York and so we recorded in LA um we did our first recording we spent hours recording in his hotel that day and then um I edited all that all summer and then there were some tweaks and some things to correct and I he was shooting a film in Philadelphia I sent him a cut he watched it and said this is this is this is pretty uh this is powerful, like what you're putting together here. He says, I want to tweak a couple of things. And so I went to Philadelphia. We recorded again and made some adjustments while he was shooting a film there. He was shooting a film called Signs, which was a, a film with Mel Gibson and um, about aliens in a farm that were, so that was the film he was shooting at the time. And then um, then we recorded, We I added those inserts. And then there was a few tweaks that you do in a movie, like ADR, you know, audio, you know, just tweaking stuff and getting it right and smoothing it out. Recorded one other time in New York. And he came back to LA for just the final tweaks. That's why if you listen to it, because there was very small budget, very crude film. Uh, I listen to it and I hear his voice change because I can tell we're in different rooms when we're recording it. What have you seen in these slaughterhouses for people who haven't watched Earthlings or people like me who cannot watch Earthlings? I've tried to watch it multiple times and mm -hmm. I have a, I think I have a trauma response when I watch it and my body starts to shake and I, I just, um, I can't do it. So, uh, but I'm vegan. It is traumatic. It is it, traumatic. It really is. And, and I've also experienced abuse in my past. So I think something mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just too much for me to uh, handle mentally and emotionally. It's just really, 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 it's really disturbing mm -hmm. deeply, um, at least to me. So, but I've tried to watch it multiple times, but for people who either can't get through it or um, haven't seen it yet and uh, maybe interested and want to hear the truth and are open to the truth, what happens in these slaughterhouses? I, I just want to bring enlightenment to viewers who may not know. There is no more fitting term than a house of slaughter. Um, it's curious because if you went to an auto manufacturing facility and watched the assembling of a car, an assembly line, it would probably be rather interesting, possibly even fascinating how they, you know, put the car together. Whereas in a slaughterhouse, it's sort of the opposite. It's the deconstruction of something. It's the pulling apart of something that is alive, that is complete, that is whole, and breaking it into pieces. And um, here in America, the uh, USDA um, regulates um, how this is done. And there are several USDA representatives at any slaughterhouse. So a slaughterhouse I, I filmed at most recently, I think had memory serves, maybe 14 USDA representatives were on the floor when they kill her. That's a lot. I mean, they're almost in every section as it were, and uh, so they're monitoring and, and, and per the USDA, an animal has to expire within 60 seconds, within 60 seconds. Um, now, 
60 seconds is a long time if you're in pain. Especially if you're pain at the level of you're about to die. That's yeah. a lot. Unto death. Unto death. Yeah. So it is, it is, uh, I mean, the body won't survive it, right? The body, the, the, the vessel won't survive it. So, but they're there to do it very quickly. And um, so I filmed, um, I filmed kosher slaughter. I filmed regular slaughter and, um, I don't know how much you want me to specifically go into it, and we can always add it. Like, I remember vividly a, a kosher slaughter house, and I was permitted to come in and film, and I stood right behind the rabbi. Rabbi was in front, the USDA inspector was right behind me, and I'll never forget it because the inspector said to me, Here, because he knew that I'd been given permission to come in, and he said, and he, because so, so long we've, we've sort of tried to film, document these things, which you can't see, and you try to get hidden footage or whatnot. But here was permission, it was granted permission to, to film. And I'll never forget the USDA inspector saying, can you see everything okay? And that was unusual to have that type of unfettered access. Um, and the rabbi stood in front and I watched several cows coming through. I stood there for more than one. And um, this man uh, had a, it wasn't just a knife, it looked almost like a machete. So it was much longer. And I remember it appeared to be exceedingly sharp, exceedingly sharp. And it was almost like, it almost looked like a mirror. It almost reminded me of Excalibur, like a sword from the movie. It just appeared to be this very sharp, piece of mirror almost that he held it was very clean it was very clean cleaned after each slaughter and he was standing there waiting and he was he had his thumb and he was just checking the sharpness of the blade while well, this cow came in and um she comes in it's a more of a profile she comes in and her head goes through and there's a a sort of a device that presses her presses her chin up that holds her head well not only holds her head in position but but elevates it so the chin is up now the wall there's a wall in front of her which is sprayed with our arterial blood from all the cows from that let's that have preceded her and one thing i'll never forget about this particular cow is that she had very long eyelashes and because i'm looking at her from the side i could see these beautiful eyelashes on her and i just thought for a moment i looked at her this is the supreme moment just moments before she's leaving the earth and she was so beautiful she was just so beautiful and her eyelashes were there and she's waiting and whether she's conscious or semi-conscious or aware of what's happening because she can smell it or hear it but she can't move there's nothing she can do and now was this was the moment now was the moment and he brought this i call it a machete it's probably not a machete but it reminded me of what looked like a machete yeah and in one very rapid motion, he went all the way up almost to her ears and back down like this in just literally a second, just straight up and out. And in that in that one second, let's say, she didn't even flinch. Oh. It's as if it happened so fast, but within a moment after the body <laughs> reacted. So that's just that slight delay for a moment. And then, of course, you might say all hell breaks loose, you know, in the body what we would call it just it just you know the, the uh, survival is the first law of biology as we've established so and then she'll collapse she'll collapse under the weight her body will collapse and go through a process now she needs to be dead within 60 seconds per the usda and one way they check they usually die sooner than that because it's very fast but one way they check it is they'll touch the eye they'll touch the eye to see if there's any if there's any consciousness with it if they're bl blinking at all and then the disassembling immediately begins. She'll drop through a side. She'll be chained from the hoof and lifted up. And one of the first processes is to take the skin off. So there's a skin removal machine. And there are people that work in that. And then she'll just be, and they'll just start taking the body apart. The USDA will inspect the parts of the flesh for cancer cells. We saw some of that in some, so those will be isolated. Um, 
the spine and the skull are eventually removed, so, you know, for for safety reasons, and they just take this body apart. I'll never forget seeing um, this one facility, another facility. The heart, they would take the valves from the hearts, and they would go into this one room, and this one guy would just do nothing but take the heart and cut out these valves, and the valves would be placed into a cooler. And these valves later go to hospitals for heart valve transplants. And the owner told me that he makes, if memory serves, I think he makes 12 or 14, maybe max $15 per valve, per heart valve. Now, a heart valve operation could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the valve itself, the slaughterhouse owner was paid about $12. Of course, the price of the animal was absolute. Everything. There's just a little a glimpse into what one sees at a slaughterhouse. That's a cow slaughterhouse, chicken slaughterhouse. There's pig slaughterhouses. There's goat and sheep and so forth. That gives you an idea. Or we could just stop eating it and they could go away. Right. The You'll get all kinds of arguments against why we shouldn't stop eating it. All kinds. Um, economical will be a big one. The economical factor. Well, one of my questions um, is what would you tell somebody of faith, no matter what faith, um, that has a, a practice, whether in their faith or in their family, over the years... Um, that God put animals on this earth to eat. I don't even like saying that. I mean, it's just so frustrating to me. But for somebody who may think that, um, how, what would you tell them? Because I, this is like, I, I feel like it's one of my major missions in life is to open people's eyes in, in the, in with Christians specifically, because I am a Christian and um, it's, it, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming, you know? And uh, what would you, what would you say? What do you, what do you say? It's really a question of from a religious perspective, like a Christian perspective, it's really a question of interpretation. So you look at a text such as the Bible and you can say here, it says this, and then it's how do we interpret it? Most clergy, most televangelists, anybody that are focused on a certain point in scripture are interpreting, you know, hopefully accurately what, what's written. If you're telling the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, you read it as it's written, and then you help interpret it to the audience, to the to the members of the church. In attendance so they understand how that applies to modern life and how they can use it in their life because it's a lesson right so it's interpretation one of the biggest problems we have with religion is misinterpretation mm. of canonized scripture you know stuff that we consider holy and sacred or we wouldn't be fighting so much over religious belief not only with other religions, but within our own, because you, you, because even Christianity broke off. So you have Lutheran, you know, uh, Presbyterian, right, Methodist, and so forth. So it's interpretation. So where they get that from, an answer to your question is, is, is God gave dominion. You know, it's right there in Genesis. And so the interpretation, you can see how they come by that, honestly, is like, oh, we have dominion. But it's very simple if they're open to really breaking down interpretation, accurate interpretation. Because it says somewhere else in Deuteron Deuteronomy that you can stone your daughter or sell her off to slavery. So we say, well, hold on a second. Maybe it's a time out for just a minute. Let's interpret that. <laughs> Maybe we should just take a second to interpret that. They're willing to interpret that one. Hang on a second. Was it written at a certain time? I'm misunderstanding. They're open to interpretation. It's not impossible. This one asks something of them now uh, that's harder for them. And you say, well, the Queen of England has dominion over former queen of England, let's say, uh, over her subject doesn't mean she can eat them or wear them. So we have to understand what dominion means. And so it's just really, um, but you know, Gianna, I can speak boldly and this won't be popular maybe among people of faith, but it's not just Christians. It could be Buddhists. It could be 
Muslims, it could be people of Jewish faith, but if it's not coming from the pulpit, they may have more blood on their hands than they realize because people will listen to the pulpit. They'll listen to the Dalai Lama. They'll listen to a rabbi. They'll listen to the Pope. They'll listen to a leader of their faith. And if the leader of their faith withholds, knowing people will listen, they may have more blood on their hands than we realize. But that's not for me to judge. I'm just. Well, for sure. I mean, listen, we are all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all need Jesus. We all need to be, know that we're forgiven and know that there is a way to be forgiven for sure. And that's one of the reasons I created my show, because nobody really wants to listen to anybody when it comes to health other than their doctor. And so it got really frustrating to me that, um, you know, the people I would talk to and uh, my friends or whatever, other animal activists or advocates, and people would kind of just brush it off like, oh, well, I'm just going to listen to my doctor. And, you know, some people are on medications and they, they're they not sure what to do with their diet. And there's just not, I mean, like even the doctors that I've had on my show will tell you outright that there's no... There's no official training in medical school of how many years, like 10 years of, of becoming a doctor, mm -hmm. three patients for health. Mm -hmm. You don't, they don't really get taught on diet therapy, nutrition, so, yeah. nutrition and, and proper nutrition, actual healing nutrition. And, uh, and so that's one of the reasons I created my show because I, I want to, show people that there are doctors out there that know what they're talking about and you can listen to them. So absolutely. If it's not coming from the pastor or, you know, spiritual leader or advisor, um, that's a great responsibility that they need to learn. And Christianity is one of the most unhealthy religious groups. Hmm. The body is a temple and the body is an unhealthy temple that the spirit dwells in. Like we're not, it's it's the same thing with like what God tells us to do and what to stay away from. It's not to condemn us and point his finger at us, this this all judging evil. It's he's he does it because he loves us and he wants us, we're gonna benefit from it if we do what he tells us to do and stay away from what he tells us to stay away from. It's for our benefit. This is what you and I are talking about right now. It's not to judge the pastor or the spiritual leader it's to help them mm -hmm. it's to help them and, and their members the, the body of christ it's to help them for their benefit so thank it, you for what one, one quick thought on that if i may is that also like it, it could be that we are not supposed to be commanded in all things meaning free will you're presented you find yourself at a crossroad a true threshold potentially a barrier and you look for an answer somewhere but it's for sometimes not always you won't be commanded in all things you listen to your heart you forget what your mother or your father said or your pastor said and for a moment you're interfacing with something in life for a second, and it's really all up to you and no one else to choose. Let's see. Hmm. How will he or she choose? Truly. The ultimate litmus test is free will. Um, so maybe, I don't know. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of, scripture in there that says i mean isn't it interesting in the as it's written in the book of genesis that it wasn't good for adam to be alone and yet the first thing brought about were animals not yet a woman and god told him to name them what he do we name yes, we name them we name them and uh so Our his people. first companions as it's written were animals and for people who are lonely that today, even now we have emotional support, animals, truly the definition of a companion. 
traveling companions. I mean, it's beautiful. And how this is overlooked or missed is um, maybe convenient. Um, so. I, I mean, Sean, I could talk about this all day long, especially with you too, because listen, I know that we have different spiritual beliefs and, and mm. practices and, um, but our, our, the common denominator is we love animals mm. and we want to reach people to be more compassionate and mm. to, to open their eyes to truth and, and love. And, uh, and I think it's really, I think it's really beneficial to come together and talk with people who may believe different things, but still can agree that we should be loving our neighbor as ourselves. That's what Jesus commanded us to do. And it's like, I mean, compassion is, is, um, it's the word I'm looking for, uh, universal, you know, there's, it's like math. <laughs> it is, it is. Well, it just is. I mean, but the thing is too, that's interesting about animals. This is very interesting to me. Yeah. 95%, I would say of people you talk to would agree that animal cruelty is not okay. Now, Gianna, I mean, really, if you walk up to people on the street, almost anybody which is most people would say, because most people don't really look too deep into a slaughterhouse or into all these industries and how their how their perfume is tested or how their clothes or their shoes are. And they don't look too far beneath the surface. But for the most part, if you ask anybody, they abhor animal cruelty. No one wants to look at it. We have a line in the movie Earthlings, when we wince at the suffering of animals, that spe feeling speaks well of us because it's, it's mercy. It's this inherent compassion. Now, take any other subject on earth that you can think of and i mean any subject and tell me where you can get 90 to 95 percent of agreement between people there isn't one the fact that 90 plus 95 percent of people agree that animal cruelty is is awful and we can't seem to cross this gulf is baffling to me and needs to have a light shined on it more and brought to people's attention and perhaps a conversation like this is a is a spark for something like that you know yeah, i really hope so we take nine billion tons of plant food from the planet every single year and we only eat 1.5 billion tons of that food we have roughly 7.3 billion tons of plant food given to the animals first and then the animals only produce 0 0.19 billion tons that's a 40 to 1 ratio so do we have a population problem or do we have an eating problem? And how do you think we solve this problem? Yeah, under current food production system, it is completely unsustainable. Completely unsustainable. If you took all that and whatever the first number was, if you took, you know, if you took 40 million to the bank and they gave you back 1 million, you might be pretty, <laughs> you're pretty upset. Then you'd say, well, can I get a subsidy somewhere? <laughs> Which is what we do. We give subsidies, right? Uh, it's completely unsustainable. Not only that, I'll do you one better. Um, how is it we have the, you know, the, the numbers vary between 60 to 80 billion animals slaughtered per year globally. Let's say 70, we'll put it right down the middle, 70 billion animals, not including seafood, by the way. Uh, so 70 billion animals, maybe it's 80, 80 billion animals are slaughtered annually, globally, to feed 8 billion people. How is it we can feed 80 billion animals and we can't feed 1 billion humans? Most of them being children. Something very wrong with this math. There should be no world hunger on this earth. We have plenty of food. We feed 80 billion animals. That awful statistic you just read, that unsustainable, ridiculous statistic every year, world hunger should not be a problem. When I hear we have a drought or we have, well, there's drought issues, but when we have world hunger issues, I'm thinking we feed 80 billion animals every year. We can't feed 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion people. And some of these animals are pretty big. Chickens, one thing, but pigs and cows, they eat a lot of food. World hunger should not exist. It's because of our current food production system which is unsustainable and cannot go on indefinitely. Now, um, how do we, they want to double this number, by the way, they want to double this 80 billion by 2050. 
But how do we, where do we grow all this food to feed all these animals? By clearing forests, by clearing forests. But we've already cleared 50% of the forests on earth. We've already cleared 50% of the forests on earth. So we're going to clear more forests to feed more animals, this unsustainable process, or we encourage people to try a different diet. But the taste buds are so strong, Gianna. It all starts and stops at the lips. It's so strong. It there's never been a movement like it before. You couldn't end. Uh, you couldn't. Gandhi couldn't stop the British Empire with a menu. Um, you couldn't end World War II with a menu. No laws have to be written. No wars have to be fought. It starts and stops right here at the lips. But now all you're asking for is one of the toughest things to ask people for, which is the will to act. Just my two cents. I agree. Um, I wrote something down. I'm looking for it. It was a note. I, I can't find it right now. But um, you you said in one of your interviews or in your bio or something, you've in one of your scripts, you've said this before, and it's brilliant, that animal agriculture and killing animals for food is one of, if not the most, or the biggest mistake that human beings have ever made yeah yeah animal agriculture is potentially one of the biggest mistakes we've made in terms of feeding people because it so ineffectively feeds people you know the process of it is so utterly wasteful and destructive to ecology to the environment and it's so it, it's extraordinary it's so addictive i mean you can tell somebody right now you can tell your audience okay new rule we're putting our foot down no more brussels sprouts and you probably not have anybody really go, ah, you know, I'm not going to lose sleep over that one. So that's, that's fine. But if you said to the same group, no more eggs, you know, you'd have some people going, well, wait a second. Now, hold, hold on a second. And this is the indication of an addiction. Um, if you told a smoker they can't smoke starting right now or a drinker they can't drink starting right now they, because there's an addiction. There's an addiction component to it. So now you say no more cheese. No more cheese. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. If we said, listen, the number one cause of death is plutonium. Okay, so the number one cause of death is plutonium, so we all got to stay away from plutonium. Most people would be like, you know what? You're right. Plutonium is out. We're not dealing with plutonium. But then you say, well, the number one cause of death is actually not plutonium. The number one cause of death is the American diet. And you got to take this way. You probably people go, you know, I'm going to take my chances. <laughs> my chances. That's the hold it has. That's the stranglehold that food has that starts and stops with the lips right here. Human beings are so powerful and we don't even realize how powerful we are, but we can overcome and conquer addiction. Mm -hmm. We can. Sure. There's hope. Okay. So how much water and land are taken up to meet the demand for flesh and blood? Levels? Animal agriculture is the number one user of water and the number one polluter of water. And they get to be, for the most part, unregulated. Refineries are regulated. Sanitation facilities are regulated. Um, rendering plants are regulated. You know, fossil fuel industries are regulated. For whatever reason, animal agony, these guys are brilliant. Maybe deviantly brilliant. Uh, they're not regulated. Number one user of water, number one polluter of water. It's unsustainable on so many levels, but that will to act to get people to just try something different. Who knew it would be so difficult? It's an addiction. And we are 95% of people are addicted to food. So addicted, they'd rather go to their graves because the American diet or the Western diet is the number one cause of death. It bumps smoking, as you know, because you've had Gregor on your show and he does a great job pointing that out. Thank you so much for tuning in. Love Gianna and... Sean Monson.